Greetings, everyone. Uh, I am Valerie Fletcher. I'm the Executive Director of the Institute for Human Centered Design, and you are at our uh, IATD Global webcast today, featuring our longtime friend, colleague, collaborator, uh, Jeremy Meyerson. Um, this is part of our series in memory of Eliza Forrest K. Bromfield, and uh, pleased to continue to celebrate the life of that remarkable young woman. Jeremy is somebody who has always uh, made this work fun. Um, he is an enthusiast, an optimist, and he's going to share a lot of that with us today. Um, we strongly urge that you pick up this book, Designing a World um, for Everyone. Uh, it's a terrific read, but it's also terrific illustrations with hundreds of color photos. Um, Jeremy has, has had a writer, as a, an academic, a researcher, and he continues to be deeply involved in all of those things. Um, there is going to be a good bit, a bit of time at the end uh, for questions and answers, and we strongly urge that you um, let us know what you want to talk to Jeremy about. We very much hope this becomes a dialogue. So uh, without further ado, I turn the floor to my friend Jeremy Meyerson. Thank you. Well, thank you, Valerie, and thank you, everybody, for joining. I know uh, with a global webcast, you're in every corner of the planet. And, uh, but this is a subject, uh, the subject of inclusive design, which is, I hope, uh, relevant to everybody um, wherever you are. Um, my name is Jeremy Myerson. I'm the Helen Hamlin Professor of Design at the Royal College of Art. And I also am director of something called Work Tech Academy. And maybe we'll talk a little bit about the future of work later on. Um, but what I want to do today, uh, and thank you, Valerie, for the wonderful invitation and opportunity to speak to this very important community. What I want to do today is um, share with you um, some stories and case studies from a new book I've written. It's called um, Designing a World uh, for Everyone. Um, and it is uh, the story uh, of inclusive design over the last 30 years but told through the prism of the Helen Hamlin Center for Design, which is the Royal College, Royal College of Arts largest and longest running uh, unit for design research. Now, you know, um, 30 years in the lifespan of departments in August universities uh, on both sides of the Atlantic, that's, that's not a huge amount of time, but in the world of art and design, I'm sure you'll agree that to have a research center um, uh, stick at it and grow uh, and, and build a network over a 30 year period, um, uh, that is a bit more of a uh, thing to mark. And so, so what, we're, what we're gonna do is, is we're gonna talk about the evolution of inclusive design, and uh, we're, going to, we're going to take you through um, some of the projects in the book. The book has a very simple structure. It's not an academic book, I've written a few of those, um, uh, but this was, designed for a general audience. Um, and we've taken 30 everyday objects and environments, things you encounter in your life uh, on a regular basis. And we've looked at the Helen Hamlin's uh, Research Center's influence on them. Uh, everything from a saucepan um, that's uh, much easier for people with arthritis to lift to a bus stop, which is, which is more intelligible uh, to help an older person getting onto a bus. Um, and on the left there, and I'll talk about this later, a current project in Northern Ireland um, to create um, not just a suicide barrier on the, uh, on the River Foyle, uh, the, the Foyle Bridge, but also a, um, the largest uh, art installation uh, in Europe. So um, lots to talk about. And I suppose I want to start uh, at the beginning. And the book opens with a story. Um, uh, we were working on the, uh, um, one of our earliest uh, industrial collaborations. Um, Center was founded in, in, in 1991. Um, and in the late 90s, Roger Coleman, my, my co-founder and I, we found ourselves working for British Airports Authority. And they came to the Royal College of Art because they had a brief. Um, they were looking at building Terminal 5, the fifth terminal at Heathrow. And it was going to be an absolute monster. It was also going to be on two levels. And they were very worried about wayfinding. And they were very worried 
they had a lot of demographic data which told them that the, the traveling public, a large proportion would be older and would have disabilities and it needed to be inclusive and how could we help them? So we did uh, uh, research in the existing Heathrow terminals, which at that time were pretty dire, they were pretty run down. They were dank and dark and confusing. And um, we, we, we had people with visual impairments. We asked them to buy coffee, go to particular gates, and we tracked what they were doing and how they were getting their information and, and so on. We were doing you know, standard kind of ethnographic shadowing techniques. And after about a month, um, I had a meeting with a group of BAA executives and they said, tell us what you found out. And I said, well, older people go to the toilet a lot in airport terminals. And they all laughed and said, you know, tell us something, you know, we don't already know. And uh, I said, well, do you know why they go to the toilets in airport terminals? It turned out they were going into the toilet because in a ceramic clad small space, they were getting perfect sound and they could hear, hear flight announcements. And it was also an opportunity to put close up graphics. So they were putting graphic information about flights in the toilets. And armed with that um, revelation, um, we then proceeded to uh, um, suggest, and you know, Terminal 5 is absolutely massive. It's, um, it costs four, four point two billion pounds to build uh, to handle 35 million passengers a year. It's a huge, huge cavernous space. And we suggested putting what we called information or acoustic arches in, in the space um, uh, that uh, people of all ages and abilities could go into them and they could get, get close up graphics, really good sound. These booths, these kiosks would be, um, would be ceramically clad and um, and although they didn't immediately take up the idea uh, eventually this idea of, of the piece of micro architecture in a large concourse became very common in European um, European airports and it all started with an observation of how older beh people behave in the airports and it showed that by looking at the margins of need you end up with a mainstream innovation and that was the story which started uh, the book. And it was also our first, as a research centre, our first real large scale industrial collaboration. And what we thought we were doing was the standard inclusive design approach to the built environment. Yes, it was an interior environment, but it, it, it had the scale of a city. And uh, what we realised during the course of this landmark project was that it wasn't simply about access to the built environment. It, it, the, the mission statement for Terminal 5 was creating the world's most refreshing interchange. It's a very different brief. They were looking at, at uh, travelers being able to re recharge and refresh elements of, of intrigue and curiosity. And we realized that inclusive design was going to move very, very quickly into new territory. So, in a sense, uh, when we started in the early 90s, um, uh, Roger Coleman and I and our small team, some of whom are still with the centre, um, uh, we inherited, if you like, a kind of set of ideas around universal design, design for all. It was very much about aids and appliances, about products, uh, about fixes. Um, people really wanted to jump to the solution very quickly. They wanted to find an answer to things. It was centered around age and ability, um, countering ageism and, and, and so on and so forth. It was very much around older and disabled people. And it was uh, uh, centered on usability and functionality, physical access, physical health, and very much coming from the culture of the built environment. And it was about reducing barriers. It was about making things less, um, uh, more tolerable uh, and removing stress and allowing people to do the activities of daily living. Didn't mean it was enjoyable, it, it meant uh, it was tolerable. And where we've got to over the last 30 years, and, and, and I say we, 
the community globally, and I include the Institute in Boston, which Valerie has led, um, where we've got to is, is um, a completely different picture. Um, where once we had, you know, aids and appliances, you know, it was Gadget City, we're now looking at a des design for services and systems. Um, where once clients would say to us and partners, you know, give us a solution, give us a quick fix. Now we're spending much more time. Really, the whole project is the deep dive onto the problem, and others may uh, implement based on our analysis. Um, where once it was age and ability, it's still that, but the dimensions of inclusive design are much broader. They're to do with gender, with race, with, with social equity, and of course, in the pandemic, um, uh, health and social uh, inequalities have been uh, magnified. Um, uh, a big switch has been, and I'll come on to that in one or two of the case studies, is the jump from usability to desirability, from, from need to aspiration, from you know, making something acceptable to making something enjoyable. Um, and, and tandem with that, we've moved from, from an obsession, uh, quite rightly an obsession, if you think of the history of universal design in the States with the disability rights movement mirroring the black civil rights movement, from physical access to the built environment to a broader notion of social inclusion and what it means and in all its various dimensions. Not just about physical health, but about mental well-being, not just about uh, physical differences, but neurodiversity and different, different ways of seeing the world. And not just the built environment, but digital, the digital realm and digital communication. And critically, um, we're still trying to reduce barriers, but we're also trying to build resilience. And there's been a big debate in the UK around the future of inclusive design, because you can, you can, you can remove all the barriers for people uh, with different needs. Um, but is there a therapeutic element to inclusive design? Do you help them build resilience? Um, and I'll show a couple of projects which try to do that. So this shifting dynamic in inclusive design is one that absolutely fascinates me. And it's kind of happened on my watch uh, over the last few decades, um, uh, but, but without really um, understanding uh, until I got the chance to step back and write the book what these dynamics were really about. So just to give you an example, um, uh, the shift from usability to desirability. That's a very, very interesting shift. Um, uh, early in the 2000s, we were, we were approached by a manufacturer called Ideal Standard in Europe who, who make bathrooms and they're very interested in the older market. And they were very interested in uh, the way older people didn't really want to take, they didn't want to take a shower. They were used to, they were historically, culturally programmed to take baths. And bathroom design at that time for older people was about safety. It was about sterility. There was no sensuality. But we developed a narrative around the bathroom as a place of pampering, of, 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 of appearance, of feeling good, of mental well-being in relation to your, the way that you look. And you know, yes, you've got to have anti, you know, grab rails and anti-slip materials, but we began to suggest a, a, a new language of design, um, wet rooms um, based on the garden hose here. Um, uh, you know, we really, in our concept work, we really, and we did a lot of research with users, we, you know, we really, you know, stalactites and, and you know, caves of wonder, if you like, uh, rethinking what the bathroom could be for an older person. And we actually came to market with this, this uh, product uh, designed by one of our um, uh, research associates, Tomek Wigelik, who's now a professor in Warsaw. Um, and this is a basin and mirror combination. Um, and it was based on detailed ethnographic research with uh, older actresses in the West End. And um, it was, uh, uh, it, it's a set of kind of glowing elements that kind of float free from the wall. Um, uh, there, is, there, is, there is a crane tap because a lot of 
uh, older actresses like to wash their hair in the sink. And there is what looks like a table tennis bat, but if you remove it, um, you can look at the back of your head. And that's very important for some people uh, as well. And the circular light puts a very even distribution of light uh, over, over your face so that you, you feel better and you're getting a true reflection. And this was, this was launched um, and, and got a lot of interest because of the new language moving from usability to desirability. We've also done quite a bit of work in the kitchen and um, we, we worked closely with, with Arthritis uh, Research UK, big British charity, and, and, and issues of dexterity have come up in a lot of our work. And they wanted us to come up with um, gadgets for want of better work. They wanted to be able to uh, create IP and they want, but they wanted to address, um, they wanted to address uh, um, the, the problems with, with cooking that their, that their, that their um, constituency were facing. And yes, we, we did some of that. We, we produced um, a, a product that you can see on the left in which you have an integrated grater and chopping board. So, so you can use one hand to steady yourself. You don't have to hold the grater down um, and it's all very firm. And that's been a very, very uh, um, simple but effective solution. But our most interesting innovation was based on understanding different cultures and different races. London is a multicultural uh, uh, community. We have links with different communities. And we worked with the Afro-Caribbean uh, community uh, in London. And they have a lot of traditional recipes um, which re require a lot of dexterity. There's a lot of kneading and holding of food and manipulating food. And what we produced was a cookbook for all people uh, of all races um, to actually cook food uh, that required them um, delicious food, that there was an inducement for them to challenge in a therapeutic way their arthritic condition to actually produce the food. So a different way of looking at inclusive design from, from a product that helps you cook to a cookbook that helps your arthritis. We worked with, um, as part of an exhibition I did, um, uh, we worked with Priestman Good, the designers, uh, and we did a lot of research around the mobility scooter at the Royal College of Art. We have, we're an entirely postgraduate institution. We teach all the different design disciplines, including vehicle design. And we, um, for a long time, we were really uh, desperate to redesign the mobility scooter because the mobility scooter is, is, is a bit of a, problem in that I mean it does the job um, and you know it's transformed millions of people's lives but it can only be used by one person at a time uh, it's unhelpful for social interaction with others and in the UK you have to park it outside your home so you're sending a message locally in the neighborhood frail older person lives here um, and you can't take it into a shop so we tried to re-envisage the mobility scooter to reimagine it um, from a broader sense of social inclusion. Um, and it does so, it doesn't stereotype the person. And what we developed was the idea of uh, the scooter for life. So kids um, use push scooters and their parents, trendy parents use push scooters. So they kind of in touch with their kids. So why can't a grandparent use a much heavier three-wheeled, very solidly, um, solidly based mobility scooter. Um, and this is the idea of, 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 of throughout your life, the basic module changes. And of course, you can take shopping in it. It has a GPS system on it. Um, you can add an engine on it. Um, uh, you know, you're struggling to push and you can lean on it. I mean, it, 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 it doubles as a kind of Zimmer frame. And this has attracted a great deal of interest. And this, I think, plays to the broader sense of social mobility and integration, rather than just conquering the built environment. And in terms of culture and in terms of understanding cultures, 
the Helen Hamlet Center for Design, we've been very connected with different bodies around the world, and we've been able to work internationally uh, with, with other design and research teams. And we've looked particularly at the, the issue of the care home, because the care home, you know, we talk about the span of people in a care home from agile to fragile. You know, some people are physically fragile, some people have dementia, and the care home environment has to provide for all of it. And we've done different things in different places. So in Scandinavia, um, uh, with the long dark winters, we were focusing on, on furniture for social interaction. And these are conversation chairs uh, designed by a very talented young researcher called Lisa Johansson. And basically these are almost soundproof booths where people can sit opposite each other and relatives can speak to their elderly uh, uh, a loved one and we know that acoustics are very difficult when you've got lots of people in public care home spaces. In the UK um, we worked with Bupa and we were looking at issues of human dignity. A lot of, pair, a lot of um, children of people in care in Bupa care homes were complaining that the staff were giving, um, they were giving the residents drinks out of beakers. They were doing that so that they drank more and spilt less. But what we did was we designed ceramic beakers that were high quality and uh, did the job, but you weren't infantilizing uh, the user. And in Hong Kong, uh, my colleague Rama Girawu led a program called, called Aging in the Vertical City, you know, where space standards are so small and so could the bed space um, be redesigned with new colors and new fabrics, new storage spaces to be much more multifunctional. And understanding different cultures and ethnic backgrounds um, has been one of the new frontiers of inclusive design. Now, we, um, for a long time, were dealing with uh, physical issues. We were dealing with mobility, with with um, dexterity, with locomotion. Um, we were dealing with grip. We were, we were looking at the physical axes of, of everyday living. We were very nervous about going into cognition and neurodiversity. Um, but eventually we had the opportunity to do something meaningful with a community of hard to reach autistic adults who were living in sheltered accommodation. And, and we were able to, rather than do something superficial over a period of five years, to get involved in the design of spaces, design of, of, of appliances, and also the design of gardens. For autistic adults, um, the garden is terrifying. The things we like about gardens, you know, sun, going across the sky and creating a changing shadow pattern or suddenly leaves fall, falling off a tree. You know, for people who are, are, are uh, hypersensitive, um, it's a nightmare. And, you know, a lot of these uh, sheltered places for autistic adults have nice gardens, but you never go in them because they're scared of them. And then at the other end of the spectrum, because when you've met one autistic person, you've met one autistic person, you've got hypno uh, sensitive people who, who, who you know, are oblivious to the dangers that you have in, you know, um, uh, in gardens. So we designed a garden specifically for, for uh, autistic adults. It's got different areas. Um, and as you leave the house, it's at its most cultivated. So you're still almost in the living room. There's nothing to scare the horses there. You get into the wilder parts. And we also designed spaces that play to you know, autistic people have uh, um, heightened sensory preferences and, and hobbies and obsessions. And we played to that. You know, if they were interested in windmills, we had a space in the garden with lots of, lots of things being blown by the wind. Um, and our first PhD student in the Helen Hamlin Center for Design, Katie Gaudian, she, um, she um, um, was uh, um, uh, studying on this Kingwood project. She was the leader um, uh, on, on designing um, for autistic adults. One of our um, cherished uh, issues in the Helen Hamlin Centre very early on 
and you can see it on the right, um, we, we were very interested in clothing that cares. Could a garment provide healthcare support beyond merely covering the body? And we worked with um, Levi Strauss and one of our industrial design engineers, Dan Plant, he, he uh, produced a, a, uh, um, a truly inclusive pair of jeans in which there were pads that when you fell, um, they hardened on the impact. And when you were just walking normally, it was like an ordinary pair of jeans. We thought we'd, you know, this was the Holy Grail and we thought we'd, uh, um, we'd really uh, hit the jackpot. And of course we went through a period of development with Levi Strauss and like a lot of things, they quietly put it on the shelf. But of course, this is great for people with osteoarthritis, frequent fallers, but it's also good for motorcycle couriers and skateboarders. So a really inclusive garment. And we've tried, we've worked uh, most recently with Yves Bahar, we, we featured his uh, Aura power suit, uh, which is using artificial intelligence and motors to help people um, stand up and sit down. Um, we, we've done a lot in this area. And I think another advance in inclusive design is the use of material science and, 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 and the computer science into everyday artifacts in the world of the wearable. We've done, and, and Valerie asked me, are you gonna talk about the office? And of course I can talk about the office all day, but um, um, I, won't, I won't dominate this presentation. Um, but, but the office, uh, we've done a lot of work about promoting a sensory, a more human centered approach to office design, which has tended to be very mechanistic. And the office has been a technical artifact, which has been quite difficult for people to live in. And it's been interesting in the pandemic, how people have um, not been in any great hurry to go back to the office as it was, and organizations are now realizing they've got to change. And uh, uh, they've been looking a lot recently, and just in recent months at the kinds of things we've done in the Helen Hamlin Center around, around creating a more healthy and more varied uh, and more human environment. We, were, we did a project long before you know, green walls and biophilia was in every office. We created a biophilic space uh, at, at uh, a large pharmaceutical company and, and tested uh, how people behaved and, and, and performed in that space. They included a, a falling uh, wall of water. And we've done other work around, around uh, space planning and reorganizing space to get away from the rhythm of the machine. And I think in the new era um, post pandemic where we're not going to pack people into office, high density offices, uh, open plan, we're going to see more varied layouts. And um, some of the things that we, be, we were researching a few years ago are now uh, being uh, dusted off and uh, partners who we haven't spoken to for a few years said, remember that piece of research you did for us, uh, we need it now. Um, so it's been an interesting, interesting way of thinking about it. And um, everyone's talking about the hybrid workplace. And in 2016, we actually, um, we actually uh, did a project with a large Italian bank called Unicredit, who wanted to get closer to the community. They had these huge banking halls. And in the age of online banking, nobody was going into them. And so we helped them um, come up with a strategy where local community groups could take space, um, where there could be bookshops and coffee shops and, and, and entrepreneurs could make pitches for, for venture capital and bringing the bank branch alive. And um, post pandemic, they're activating uh, a lot of these ideas uh, in Milan and, and other cities in Italy. Um, and sometimes with design research, you, you think you've got a set of ideas which are really um, viable and really relevant. And then it all goes quiet for a few years. And then, then the conditions change and people jump back in and say, you know, we'd like to hear more. So a little bit for a moment about the uh, antecedents of the Helen Hamlin Center for Design. Um, we, uh, uh, we can trace the beginning of it to an exhibition in London at the Victoria and Albert Museum's Boiler House Gallery in 1986. It was called New Old, and it was very simple. Um, uh, Helen Hamlin, who was uh, an alumna of the Royal College of Art, a designer, 
uh, and a social uh, philanthropist with her own charitable foundation, she commissioned 16 leading international designers to redesign an, an item for the home um, to make it easier for people to stay out of institutional care and live independently. And 30 years later, I, I, I got, as the Helen Hamlin Chair, I got the opportunity with the Design Museum to recurate the exhibition, broaden the focus away from the home and include uh, um, it in, and include um, uh, sections on mobility and work and, and community uh, and so identity and so on and so forth. And this exhibition toured uh, internationally, it went to Taiwan, it went to Poland, and it went to the Pratt uh, Manhattan Gallery uh, in February last year. And very sadly, within four weeks, it was closed down by the pandemic. But there, some of the things I've shown you, like the scooter, like the Arrow power suit, um, uh, they were on display. And, um, um, but we had enough time in New York to, to actually get some feedback and we recurated it for an American audience. So four years after, um, and there's Helen Hamlin uh, giving one of her awards to an RCA student um, in the center, and there's Roger Coleman on the right. And what we were thinking about, and Helen had had problems with her own mother being forced into institutional care because she didn't have the right products for her. That's not her mother. That's one of my researchers' mother trying to um, cook a pie. And I sent that photograph to the um, the board of, of a British supermarket called Waitrose and, um, and said that they needed to do something about the small print on the packaging. They commissioned us to, to have a look at that from an accessibility point of view. Um, but Helen Hamlin funded the first iteration of the research centre. Roger started it. It was called Design Age. And, um, and immediately there was uh, internationally, there was, a, there was a tiny team and, and I was involved as a freelance, there was a, there was a current of interest around it. And we were, we were kind of, there were some guiding lights who were really pushing things forward. Um, we were very uh, interested in moving away from, from market-centered design, targeting the average. All of this will be well known to, the, uh, to uh, um, Valerie's network, but of course, we were moving to inclusive design if you, if you, um, if you go to the margins of need, you will automatically include everybody uh, in the middle. And, uh, and this is a slide which shows the different phases of the center um, over a 30 year period. And of course, when we set up the center, we, were, we had some guiding lights out there who were really um, kind of for Roger and I, you know, we really looked very closely at what they'd achieved. I'm talking about Selwyn Goldsmith, um, who wrote design, Designing for Disability in 1963. Um, Patty Moore, uh, who traveled around New York and other American, North American cities for three years in the late 1970s, and really invented empathy tools and probes and, and this whole kind of uh, uh, um, uh, ethnographic phase of research. Um, and, and Patty's been very closely associated with the center. Um, we were interested in the work of Ron Mace and the seven principles of universal design and everything that happened there. And of course, Victor Papenek, who, who actually visited the Royal College of Art on a number of occasions um, and once told me, incidentally, that his earliest childhood memory was going on a Zeppelin um, from Vienna to New York. Uh, and not, not New York, Vienna to um, uh, Berlin. That's right. Um, and it was those kinds of people who, 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 who inspired us. So we had a period of definition uh, and Roger led this. He, 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 he defined the term inclusive design in a paper for, a, for an ergonomics, um, exhibition, uh, ergonomics conference in Toronto in 1994. Um, I joined him as co-director in the late 90s and we had a period of activation where we were working with our students and our graduates and we were, we were recruiting um, a dozen research associates a year to work with industry. And then we began to have PhD students and do large scale projects like our ambulance projects, which I'll show you. And then since I stood down as director, I remain the chair of the department, but under Rama Girawa's leadership, the center has gone into a period of augmentation and use of new technologies, autonomy. we've done a lot of work around autonomous vehicles and 
virtual reality. So that's the kind of uh, how the center has developed. And of course, as I said earlier, you know, we were in the aids and appliance um, um, uh, world for quite a while, and we came up with some quite neat ones. This is one that Roger led. Um, this is with Safeway Supermarket uh, and Rockwear Glass, um, uh, having a square uh, on a jam jar, uh, a square lid so you can grip it more easily. This was Gavin Pryke in 1994, nearly 30 years ago. Uh, very clever idea. And, and we've gone on and we've done other, other work. Um, this is a work we did for B&Q, a, a, a British retailer who were huge both in the UK and China. And, we, and, and they came to us and said, we don't understand um, why older people are not buying our um, power tools. And, and, and we said, well, probably, um, uh, because they're too heavy, they're too intimidating there. And we did research and we discovered that. And we, we looked at, uh, uh, we did a, a study of older carpenters and we came up with, with really a, a fascinating, um, uh, uh, it was a fascinating project. And these were both uh, successful uh, market introduction. Um, on the left, you can see a sander and the other is a gopher is a, uh, on the right is, is a, an electric screwdriver, obviously molded to the hand, much easier to use. The, on the sander, you've got a handle which, which stops tremor. And, and we never said a word that this was for older people, um, but, but they, were mar they were marketed as mainstream products and they sold as mainstream products and they were extremely successful. And it gave us as a research center a bit of a boost you know, because we haven't, we do a lot of experimental stuff and stuff that doesn't fly. And suddenly we had something that was a nailed on market success and our research associate became a product consultant to the company. So I want to, in the time I've got left, I want to um, uh, just go into a little bit more detail uh, on, on a couple of projects, which I believe show the, the changing dynamics of inclusive design. Um, we've done a lot of work around the streetscape. We've done a lot of work around, around how people behave in streets and how they're designed. And um, in London, they started introducing uh, a, a, um, a system called um, safe, uh, uh, shared space. This is the, if you've walked down recently, if you, if you, if you, people haven't been able to get to London, I'm sure people have di been down Exhibition Road where the V&A and the Science Museum and Imperial College and the Royal College is at the top. Um, uh, um, you see a complete absence of, um, you see a complete absence of curbs, railings. Everyone's sharing the same space in a convivial democratic um, environment. So cars are having to go very slowly and weave between pedestrians, people are on bikes, nobody knows what the rules are, um, the streets has been paved in a completely different way. And this is called shared space and it was invented in a very remote village in northern Holland uh, by a, uh, a, a Dutch, um, a Dutch uh, traffic engineer um, uh, by the name of uh, uh, Hans Mondermann and he was minimizing the segregation between different uh, modes of road use by removing all the familiar markers. Well, that is great until you realize that most older people with impaired mobility or reduced vision rely on the railings. They rely on the curb line and without them, they're sunk. And so as these shared spaces started appearing across London, um, the, uh, the sight loss community and, and the charities got very militant. They said, it's an accident waiting to happen. Say no to shared space, there were lots of demos. And the government couldn't understand what was going on. And we were asked by CAVE, which is the Commission for Architecture and the Built Environment, to study this and to be the advocate of the user and to tell us what was really happening. Because they thought they were introducing something progressive and democratic and convivial. And they couldn't understand, they were, you know, um, people were being, very uh, belligerently resistant. So 
uh, our research associate, Ross Atkin, he studied London roads and he did the kinds of things you would expect. Um, he spent a day uh, uh, um, uh, working with a, traveling with a white stick and, and walking a mile in other's shoes. We recruited, uh, we, we, we tend to, uh, in the Helen Hammond Center, recruit, we do deep ethnographic research with small numbers of users. And so this is a typical uh, um, research recruitment map from urban to suburban on one level and a degree of visual impairment on the other. And you can see we, we recruited um, a mix of male and female, although the male tended to be largely suburban and the female tended to be largely urban. So it wasn't an ideal research map, but, but, but interesting for what we were doing. And we asked people to go on local journeys. We videoed them, we used GPS mapping, they, we asked them to keep a diary. And what we discovered, um, and these are the, um, London is made up of hundreds of different boroughs, all with different street design manuals and standards. So you can be walking down a road and the path will suddenly turn into something else uh, because you've left one borough and entered another. It's quite crazy, but that's the way it is in, a, in an old city. And what we discovered was that the sighted street user, um, and this is a map from one centimeter to one kilometer, you know, at one meter, say, um, uh, at one meter, the, the uh, sighted street user will use their sight and a bit of sound. And at one meter, the long cane user will use railings and curb line. And we said to Cave, this is why they're so upset. You've, you've removed their lifeline. And, you know, we, 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 we did, we did, we call them navigation resource guides and we produced them for all our users. And we came up with, with a report and recommendations. Um, uh, um, and that's, that's, that's not, not producing an appliance or an aid, it's producing guidance. And we've done a lot of work in that area, helping to implement practice and produce better streets for people with low vision. I said I'd talk briefly about our ambulance project. It's one of our biggest ever projects. Uh, it never got manufactured in the way we originally intended, and, and it's a story there, but it is an interesting story. Here you can see um, the redesigned ambulance um, with, with um, uh, just-in-time treatment packs, the patient in the middle of the ambulance, um, daylighting, a digital diagnostic system, um, easy clean injection molded plastic uh, interior based on yacht interiors. Um, so how did we get to this point? Um, that's what, when we started, that's what London ambulances look like. They were, they look like kitchens. They had everything but the kitchen sink. The, the stretcher was on one side so you couldn't get right round the patient. And the National Patient Safety Agency in the NHS had had a series of problems with, that, with accidents. Uh, and they decided that we should uh, investigate. And we went through a long period of research involving other universities, emergency healthcare professionals, ergonomics. And we came up with this, um, we came up with this um, scenario instead of, you know, the ambulance hasn't really changed from, you know, it was invented by the British in the Crimean War to swoop and scoop and take you take injured soldiers back to a field hospital. And it's not really moved on. And we were clogging up all our, all our primary care uh, hospitals with queues of ambulances outside. So could we have a more distributed system? Could we have walk-in centers and polyclinics and, and, and so on and so forth? And could we have uh, a sterile treatment room inside the back of the ambulance. So that was where we got to. And inside the RCA, we built the interior based on a Mercedes Sprinter box. We, uh, these are two of our research associates, uh, Yusuf and Gian Paolo Fazari, who's still working with us, um, and uh, Yusuf Mohammed. Uh, and they, uh, they built uh, a cardboard mock-up and began to study their parameters. We brought onto the team, this is Dixie Dean, 
She's a paramedic and she became a fully fledged designer on our, our project. And she had plenty to say about how we might do things. We became obsessed as a, as a research center with a side opening ambulance. Um, and we, we were really excited about this and built scale models. And she told us, when can you ever park an ambulance in London uh, and open side onto a street? You know, you're just not gonna do it. You know, ambulances park in the middle of the road and that's why, you know, you squirrel people in the back. Um, and she was full of great advice. We did a lot of process mapping um, and to see what people were currently doing. You don't need to read this, but you just see the level of detail, the ambulance design parameters, all the equipment, the space, you know, and people have got to move very, very quickly and very decisively and know where everything is. We used play and games and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, we, we used drawing techniques um, and we gradually built up a picture of what the ambulance could be. And we built a digital model and we validated that. Um, and, and then the exciting bit, um, I sanctioned the, the huge budget of 300 pounds so they could buy an old ambulance on eBay and get it um, kitted out. Um, Formula One fabricators called Dove in Norfolk um, uh, had worked with the Royal College of Arts and they said they would do it as a pro bono job for us. And so we bid on eBay um, and in the middle of the night, um, we managed to buy this ambulance, um, this old Australian ambulance that had been for sale. And, and we, we, we fabricated it and created a demonstrator model. It doesn't drive through the streets, it sits on a trailer. We built um, and we did clinical trials with paramedics, um, went through various scenarios. The woman lying down is an actress with, with a fake um, leg ulcer. And we collected data. We built a digital diagnostic system for when the, um, for when the um, all patient records in the NHS would be, would be um, uh, online, would be digitized. And so that as you race to an emergency, you can get all the medical history of the person you're going to treat. You're not flying blind into the dark. Um, so we compared the old ambulance with the new ambulance, how paramedics felt about it. And the data was very good, even though it was an unfamiliar environment. And in terms of cleanliness, um, we were, we, this is a colleague uh, from another university who's using an ultraviolet tort, uh, torch to measure for bacteria. Um, this new ambulance was much cleaner. Uh, paramedics liked it, it was less intimidating. Um, uh, it was performing uh, much better. And in 2012, we won the des coveted Design Museum Design of the Year Award. And, and some of the team um, are proudly uh, on the gantry of the ambulance. And we thought the world was at our feet and we weren't able to get it into production. I spoke to, I spoke to the Russian government. I spoke to the Qatari government. I spoke to manufacturers in the UK. And little by little, manufacturers took elements of it. But in a sense, we were ahead of our time. Um, there hadn't been a, a full scale digitization of medical records. And the way the ambulance was stocked with just in time packs for a fire emergency or a maternity emergency required paramedics to be completely um, uh, retrained. And it required hospitals and, and, and um, ambulance stations to be completely redesigned. So we, Learn to lesson through this in that our solutions, while innovative, were running ahead of the system design. We became very interested in, in systems and where design fits in that. And finally, I'd just like to say a little bit about um, the River Project. It's on the cover of the book and it's very current uh, at the moment. Um, it taking, it's, it's happening um, and there's about 25 million pounds of investment uh, in Northern Ireland going into it. I don't know, um, uh, some people will know Derry, London Derry. It's right at the heart of the sectarian troubles uh, in Northern Ireland. And the River Foyle is right at the heart of Derry, London Derry. And it has had a reputation for poor mental health, 
people have, uh, um, have a saying locally, ready for the foil. And it's kind of black humor, but they're gonna throw, things are so desperate um, with all the, all the unemployment and lack of investment and sectarian violence and very problematic um, uh, part of the city. And, 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 and Public Health Northern Ireland were looking at solutions. Um, and we were part of a project called Our Future Foil. And they said, well, we've looked at, you know, we've, we've looked at barbed wire and floodlighting, you know, to try and stop people throwing themselves in the river. Um, you know, we think there could be a more optimistic and more positive and more inclusive uh, approach. So, so we began a, a long term um, uh, in 2016, we began to engage with the different communities in Northern Ireland. One of the things we did was we, there's a very famous bit of Irish folklore in which um, a, a whale um, sailed up the river, they called it Dopey Dick, right in the middle of the Troubles in 1977, to great communal interest and relief. So we decided to recreate Dopey Dick. Uh, it's a wooden structure, it floats on water, and there it is in the middle there. And we did lots of workshops in schools and with adult education groups, and we built up a clear picture of, of what people were saying. And we came up with a series of social and cultural interventions. Um, uh, we talked about, uh, um, and I'll just show you a couple of them. Um, so one of the things we decided to do was create a series of satellite spaces along the river. We felt, especially in winter at night, nobody is there, nobody is going there. But what if we could create in a positive way a natural footfall? What if we could get people to go to the river? They would act like soft barriers and they would provide a natural surveillance for the area. So we've created 42 pop-up pods that local people um, can uh, rent and offer local services. And if they do mental health training, they get to a, a reduction in rent. So if they see somebody who is struggling or in trouble, they, can, they know what to do. And, and, and businesses can sponsor them. And, and, and this is how we envisage this playing out. This is by one of the bridges. Um, and sells fruit, cuts hair, offer coffee, citizens advice, and a very, very neat idea. Um, and also a place for, for choirs to come together and community groups, but it's bringing people along the river because it really is a lovely spot. We also looked, um, we did a series of temporary interactive installations along the riverfront. We worked with Queen University in Belfast and this, these were temporary, but it showed what could be done with local artists, musicians and students. Um, more than 15,000 people came along to have a look at what was happening. There were lights, there were audio things. Um, and, and what we were doing, um, they're, they're the Northern Ireland Constabulary looking at an artwork and wondering whether it's a bomb. Um, but it was great fun, listening boxes, memory boxes, history boxes, nature walks. Um, and, and, you know, this is the bleak reality of, 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 one, of, the, one, of one of the bridges. What if we could just use sound, um, uh, nice music, stories for children, um, to actually bring, to transform the environment without, you know, pulling down the infrastructure. But our most eye-catching and most successful uh, um, aspect of this project was the foil reeds. And um, uh, um, people talked about how bleak and desolate uh, the main bridge was. And, and this, is, this, is, this is the suicide bridge. And our research team noticed the local fauna and flora and thought, could we use um, reeds? Could we take the vernacular of local reeds and line the bridge with digitally interactive lighting reeds that local community people could own and create an amazing artwork but it would also act as a physical barrier. And this has taken a while to develop, but uh, we've done a lot, of, um, uh, a lot of design work. And in fact, 
two of our research team relocated to Northern Ireland, for, for, formed a company called Urban Scale Interventions, and they're delivering the project. Our kind of research work is over. But here we are in the Royal College of Art, exploring different reed shapes and reed, reed colours. And the idea is that you can control your own reed from an app. So you might get a message saying, tonight we're going purple, everybody, so everybody reprograms their reed, or you can have different colours and, and different levels of intensity and so on. And it will be, when completed, uh, one of the largest artworks in Northern Europe. So um, on this optimistic uh, uh, note, uh, I'd like to, to, to draw um, my comments uh, to a close and just a couple of final observations. Um, I think that, that in the book, you'll, you'll see a range of projects. Some were market successes, some were market failures, some were intended to generate guidance, a lot were designed to probe the problem. Um, but I think we've combined kind of three things. Um, I think there's an element of social activism in what we've done. Um, you won't be surprised that we have a social model of ageing and, and disability. We, we see age and disability as social constructs. And, and, it's, and you know, we've designed within that frame. We've also um, encouraged, uh, at a time when a lot of people are teaching design to non-designers, and we do that too, um, our approach was to take highly skilled and talented practicing designers and teach them some social science uh, basic skills around interviewing, observation, documenting data, and so on. And, and um, so, they, so they would be able to not just act on information, but capture it in the first place. And the third thing we did was to really promote the power of design. We, we, we don't believe that co-design processes design themselves. There's a point where professional designers have got to use their judgment and expertise, having been very careful in the way they understand people's needs and aspirations. So um, uh, I, I said I'd talk for under an hour, and I'm just under an hour. Uh, I'm going to stop there. If you'd like to uh, get a copy of the book, um, uh, it's published by Lund Humphreys and um, if you just Google Lund Humphreys Designing a World for Everyone, it'll take you to a page and um, I think they've got a special offer on at the moment. Um, I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to hand back uh, to Valerie. Thank you, Jeremy. That was great fun. Um, there, we have loads of questions. Um, before we get into the questions, I want to ask you about something that is a long arc of an idea that you and Roger were using at the Helen Hamlin many, many years ago, designing for your future self. Yes. And there is an event next week, designing for your future self. So let's tell people about that. First of all, tell them about how that came to pass, please. Yes, yeah, so um, in our period of definition and activation, Roger and I were trying to, um, motivate and engage with the student and faculty community at the Royal College of Art. And those of you who know the Royal College of Art, it's got a very famous reputation. And it's at the time, you know, and we're talking about the 1990s, early 2000s, you know, it was the citadel of cool. And it was full of very beautiful young people doing very beautiful young things. And we were talking about older people and frailty and disability and design for all. And we thought, well, how are we going to, um, you know, how are we going to engage with these people? And so what we did, we, we um, and I forget who it was, I think it may have been Roger, it certainly wasn't me. Um, uh, we came up with this phrase, um, design for our future selves. And this was quite transformative because people said, well, you know, it's, I, I'm vested in this, you know, uh, I'm going to be there one day. Uh, and, and it became, you know, we've used it for our competition for many years. We've used it for various things. We now have um, the Design Age original unit. We have got some government funding to reconstitute it uh, as a standalone institute. 
um, and 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 the Design Age Institute uses design for our future selves. You know, uh, uh, it may be an old idea, but a good one never goes out of fashion. Thank you for, uh, for humoring me. Uh, we will post the uh, event. It's on the 21st of September uh, at 6.30 in London. Um, but uh, I think it is available to um, connect to. So I'll let people know. Um, now I wanna turn to um, the many people who are um, looking to engage you um, and get you to answer some questions. Sure. So let me, um, let me get to those. Um, one second. Okay, so there's lots of questions on lots of things. Um, I wanna actually uh, make note of the first one, which is from our friend, uh, Dr. Nat Hosino in Tokyo. Uh, and Nat is uh, a very important colleague of ours and always has interesting ideas. And he is pointing out that the ISO has now shifted from the language of easy to use to enjoy to use. So we track ISO very closely. It isn't actually something that all Americans pay much attention to. Have you had much opportunity to interact with, uh, with ISO? Um, I haven't personally, and, and thank you, Nat, for it must be the middle of night in Tokyo. It is, <laughs> um, the early morning, <laughs> very um, early. Thank you for speaking with it. But I mean, it's absolutely to my point. Uh, we've got, you know, the standard is shifting from ease of use to, to enjoyment of use. And that's what we've seen. And that's what we've tried to do in the Helen Helen Center. And we've got some clever people um, uh, in the center who've done a lot around user experience. And, 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 you know, I think in my day, I was, I was recruiting industrial design engineers to work in the center. And now I think Rama's recruiting, recruiting software coders, you know, the world's moved on, but you've absolutely nailed it on the head. It, you know, it is about enjoyment because, you know, um, uh, um, we have to, we have to, you know, if we accept that, that age and, and disability are social constructs, it's not enough just to make things tolerable. You know, we have to make things much better than that. And, and just to, to uh, add one bit of uh, information about ISO, ISO has been working on the issue of cognitive accessibility for a period of time. There's some very something that we're talking about a lot and strongly urge certainly our American colleagues who may not be paying attention to that uh, important international resource to, to take a look. Um, one of our team, Kathy Gibbs, is fascinated by the details of that Italian bank floor. Um, can you give us any more details about that um, and what, got, what went on? Well, what we, I, I, won't, I won't pull it all up because there's lots to talk about, um, but, but just to give Kathy a bit more information, we, we, we came up with a modular kit of parts. We were working with a brilliant guy called uh, Klaus Sambiela, who is the global head of real estate for Unicredit. And we realized, <clears throat> excuse me, um, we realized that um, a coffee bar, um, a shop, um, a service unit in a, in a bank, and a genius bar in an office all have the same element, which is, which is a service bar. So we use the service bar as the core element and built modular architectural components of it so that a bank could have a bookshop, a bank tellers, a coffee shop, and maybe um, a, a co-working space, uh, all using uh, the same architectural modular component. Thank you. Um, and I have a question from a colleague in Connecticut, Jay Tulin, who is asking about if you could envision uh, inclusive design for schools and any experience that you've had with school design. Yes, we've done quite a few uh, projects in schools. Um, uh, and we have a sister research centre, the Helen Hamlin Centre for Pedagogy, which is um, naught to seven. Uh, so very young, very young children. Um, so Helen Hamlin has funded her own research centre looking at the school curriculum. Um, but we have done a big project lighting the school classroom. 
And what we discovered that there was a huge clash, and you, you know, Jay may be able to comment on this, um, between the new technology, the uh, whiteboards and video that goes into the classroom, and very old fashioned lighting in classrooms. So we were looking at new configuration of LED lighting to improve people's um, uh, um, improve people's use of light uh, in secondary schools. Um, Valerie, you've frozen on me. Can you still hear me, Valerie? You've got your, you, you're, um, you're on mute. I had a brief break in my internet connection. Right. So thank you for that answer. Um, one of the questions I was asking about how many of your colleagues and students have so the direct participation of people with lived experience in the Helen Hamlin. Um, a very good question. And um, one of our senior research associates that, who this network may know very well, Julia Kassim, um, uh, her own daughter uh, was disabled, uh, is disabled and has, is herself a wonderful designer. Um, the answer is probably not enough. Um, we were pretty good being, being a London college on ethnic diversity, but less so on disability. But we've had a lot of mentors and a lot of people, people like David Constantine, who himself is an RCA graduate. Um, we've had people with, with, uh, with, with visual impairments. We've had people with, with hearing issues. Um, and we've been pretty good at getting to the lived experience and very true to that. But I don't think um, don't forget we're recruiting from the RCA's own student body for many years. I don't think we have covered ourselves in glory on that area. Nicely put, Jeremy. <laughs> um, and another of our colleagues uh, based here, a professor of, of design, but originally a, uh, a Brit. Uh, he's interested in relationships that you've cultivated with your industry partners. Mm. Um, have the researchers found industrial partners? Do you find them? Do they find you? Tell us a little bit about how those relationships are built. Oh, well, Sean, very good to see you, hear you. Uh, um, great question. Um, this is an interesting one. When we started, we called our partners industry partners. Uh, or, you know, and, and the college wanted to, wanted, can't you call them sponsors? And they don't want to be sponsors. They don't want to be industry partners. We call them research partners. And they love that, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, because they want to, they're part of the research. And we work with some very clever people and intermediaries like the bathroom stuff I showed. That wouldn't have happened without Robin Levine of Studio Levine. He was our industry partner, but he is really our research partner. Um, it's a bit of push and pull. Um, we, uh, for example, the photograph I showed of the, of, the, of, of, of the grandmother of one of our researchers with a magnifying glass trying to, trying to cook a pie, we sent that to the Waitrose board and they said, mm, you better come and see us. Um, <laughs> other, other companies find us. Um, don't forget, I mean, you know, everyone now, you know, there's some great units and departments around the world in different places. When we started, there were very few, it was a bit pathetic really, you know, and so, and so, you know, people found us. A lot of people would come to us and um, say, tell us about our customers. Um, and some people would come to us and think, here's a cheap resource, you know, um, and, we, and we'd push them away. We turn a lot of things down because we couldn't quite find an angle. They'd have a technology and say, oh, find a use application. There might be a use application with an older person, but what they were really, they were doing some technology research. So we'd just say no. And, um, um, you know, our, our administrator 
who was trying to balance the books in the Helen Hamlin Center, you know, was practically throwing chairs at me for turning people away. But I knew that I'd have a horrible moment <laughs> in my life when, when we were having to publicly show a piece of research that had absolutely nothing to do with what we were trying to achieve. I hope that answers the question in part. Oh, I think that, <laughs> that answers it very nicely. Um, interesting to picture someone attempting to throw a chair at you. Um, another a really provocative question from Lisa Incatasiato. I know, slaughtered your name, Lisa, I apologize. But it'd be great to hear more about how you have worked with communities from different cultures. How do you develop those relationships? What formats have you used? Yes, I mean, I mean, we have uh, formed bonds with different communities, different cultures. Um, we've done it in different countries. We often work through uh, local intermediaries who've already built some trust. Um, we, we, we're pretty sneaky about sometimes how we do it. So I've learned that over the years, you don't send, you don't send the old guy in with white hair, the professor, you know, the white, you know, the white professor, you know, you send in, um, depending on the community, a young person who's, you know, trying to do a PhD, people open up much more quickly. Um, but in the end, you have got to communicate what, what the research is about and what you're trying to achieve. And then you've got to make the research process fun. So we do a lot of visualization techniques. We do modeling. We don't give people questionnaires. We don't set people homework. And um, uh, we, we, we try and bend to the, the culture of the community. And often on one project, you'll hit four communities. In the book, and I, I know you read this chapter, Valerie, the one about lighting a housing estate in London. And there, were, you know, there was a white working class community, there was a Bangladeshi community, there were clubbers who were going to the clubs in Shoreditch. They're all using this space. You know, um, uh, there were Bengali men uh, uh, and, and we had to kind of talk to all of them and we had to find a common language. We did it through food actually. We had a food sharing event. Um, and uh, there, are different, there are different techniques. Uh, um, um, but what, what I would say is that, is that in, in the early days, we made a lot of mistakes. You know, we'd send researchers who were quite inexperienced and I get a call and, and somebody you know, in a care home would say, they, they hammered this poor woman. She was sitting in the chair and she, she was too polite to go to the, you know, to say she needed the toilet. We talked at her for an hour. And so we thought, oh my God, we've got to, you know, and Julia led on this, um, um, uh, teaching the ethics of design research and respecting the person who you're sharing lived experience with. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we got very clever at, at, at um, or I won't say clever, better, you know, we tried to rectify the mistakes, you know, we made researchers check in on the, on, on the person that they're, they're dealing with every 15 minutes to check they're okay and, and you know, and we realized that we need to do more training, but you know, we're learning all the time. And, you know, I've made some horrendous mistakes in my life. Um, uh, and I'll tell you just one, because uh, Lisa might be amused by this, but um, we were doing a piece on patient safety on surgical wards. And we came up with this, we were working with Imperial College, which, you know, like a lot of American universities runs hospitals. And we had to go before a public ethics committee and a, a lay member of the public said to me, oh, Professor Myerson, he said, um, I like your research design. So you're gonna send people who are lying in bed an hour before they go in for elective surgery, nervous as hell. And you're gonna send somebody in, in with a clipboard and they're gonna say, I'd like, I'm doing a study on medical error. You know, and the whole room erupted and I felt, you know, an inch tall. And I said, thank you for your, <laughs> We will go away and rethink. 
So anyway, there you go. That's, that's a marvelous story. Let me, for the people who do not recognize the reference to Julia, um, Jeremy is referencing Julia Kassim, C-A-S-S-I-M. Um, look her up uh, online. You will easily find uh, her writing and stories about her. She's still very active, um, but living in Japan. Um, it's but important to know that. Um, I also just want to, what's that? She's in Kyoto, yeah. Oh, she's in Kyoto, right. Um, that one of the things that um, IHCD is doing is we're very much of the changing reality of um, ability and disability and its relationship to racism and inequity in the United States. So um, a lot of our work that we're building is based on uh, figuring this out. And we are traditionally committed around contextual inquiry research. So it's really important to us that our, our team who are working with what we call user experts also represent people with lived experience of disability and from diverse communities. But in the work that we are doing focused on um, multicultural communities in the US, we call it BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, and People of Color communities, um, we are shifting to adopting more of um, a PAR method, a participatory action research model, uh, so that we are really um, passing the, the responsibility for direct engagement to people in the community on the basis that only people in the community have um, deep knowledge of what the problem really is and, and the skills to be able to solve it. So um, it's, a, it, it's, a, it's a challenge. It's something that we are committed to and figuring out, but it also means that our staff look a great deal more like the people that we intend to learn from. Um, and I want to um, also call in Kasia Matlek, uh, who is a colleague of ours who has spent time uh, here in, she studied it, it, at RISD, she uh, did a fellowship at Harvard, um, and she wants to ask about your experience of bringing ideas to life. Yeah. Um, so, it, you know, I think you've talked about that a good bit, but <laughs> it's... Um, it, the bath idea is one that, that she's talking about. And, and Kasi is a marvelous industrial designer. Um, and, you know, I think she, she has a need to know, Jeremy. Give her some insight. Well, my experience has been mixed. Um, the, the project, uh, Tomek Rigalix, uh, um, uh, uh, Kasia will be pleased to know that that, that was produced. The scooter uh, is, is, is Priestman Good are in... Um, in negotiation uh, with a couple of manufacturers um, and they have the rights to that. We've assigned the rights to that. Um, and I'm hoping that will, will happen. But we've done some, you know, I mean, I think our ambulance design, which we're still incredibly proud of nearly a decade later, it never happened. And, and sometimes you're just moving ahead what you think is a mainstream idea, mm. you know, you know, um, what we came across with the ambulance um, is that uh, um, we wanted to introduce a national ambulance specification, which would be based around our prototype. Um, um, and what, what the market was happy with was 14 different ambulance trusts buying 14 different specs, because up and down that supply chain, people are making money and they got very fed up. Who are these? Who are these? idiots at the Royal College of Art telling us that we need a na national design ambulance. Our ambulance is every bit as nice as theirs, you know, you know, they've got these kind of whizzy kind of ideas. And, and, and so some things do end up in the draw, but I think nothing is ever wasted because what's happened with the ambulance mm -hmm. is I'm now seeing more ambulances with daylighting. There are mm -hmm. digital systems going into ambulances. Um, even, even the just-in-time treatment pack is being uh, um, uh, um, being looked at again um, but the value of getting something to market is really important you know we were kind of not on our knees but we were kind of uh, you know we were talking a good game when all of a sudden we did the power tools for B&Q and they were in every shop you know and it was fantastic um, uh, so so you know that helped us move forward but um, you know I don't think in, in inclusive design that a market product is the be and all, all and end all. I think the process itself and the engagement is important. But we have with the new Design Age Institute, and I encourage you, everybody, to have a look. 
a Google Design Age Institute, Royal College of Art. Um, we have a whole new institute set up and, and its, its primary role is to pick up where the Helen Hamlin Centre leads off. And it's got about a dozen Pathfinder products that it's taking to the market uh, with some government help. Um, yeah. So, you know, and they're very varied projects, you know, from a redesign of the Walker to some smart wearables to uh, uh, even a, a bank that is much better for older people and so on and so forth. So, um, uh, so we are still trying to get to the market. Okay. Um, we have a question from Kay Bell. Um, who is a community activist, and um, she is talking about, um, is it more expensive to apply inclusive design principles to buildings? In particular, she's talking about municipal building projects, uh, such as a multi-user community center, than traditional building practices. And if so, can community members sell the idea to, of inclusive design as worth it for the benefits achieved? Yes, I don't think it's necessarily more expensive as long as it's a bit like software, you know, the earlier in the process yes. you debug, <laughs> the deeper it is later on. It's when you're trying to debug the damn thing when you're practically at the point of release. And buildings are like that. I, yeah. I've seen a lot of municipal building projects where they've used traditional processes and they're designing for everybody, they say, but actually they're designing for nobody. Nobody's really satisfied and, and, and apart from the architects. And, you know, we, we've had a kind of running battle with, with the mainstream architectural departments um, over, over 30 years. We, we delight in goading them. You know, these, um, these uh, you know, you get these idealized figures um, that you stick on architectural models. It's usually a little girl with a balloon or a yeah. family uh, or, you know, and, and we had one of our research associates, uh, brilliant, brilliant guys, um, uh, uh, and uh, one from Denmark and one from Ireland. And they came up with alternative figures to put on architectural models. So it's the charity mugger, somebody being sick, a heroin addict, you know, um, to show real life, you know, what's happening in these, you know, and, 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 and more and, and less polemically, people in wheelchairs, you know, people walking with uh, a, a white stick and, and so on and so forth. Um, so, so, um, I mean, to answer Kay's question, um, you, you, you need to understand, you, you know, all infrastructure needs use and we need to understand use and we need to be, you know, a lot of building projects are about delivery. It's about design, development and delivery. And they should be more about discovery and definition. And if we spent a bit more time on discovery and definition, and that's where inclusive design techniques come in. And you can get a lot of information very quickly using some of the techniques I've mentioned, drawing techniques, getting people to pin a picture on something when they're walking locally in the area. Doing some, do, we always say to our research associates, design your research, make it fun, make it interesting. You know. And you can collect huge amounts of information very quickly. And, and just, to, just to add to that issue of timing, which is absolutely critically important, all you can do at the tail end of a design process is what someone described to me yesterday as sprinkles. Yeah. Um, that is not very effective and has not got much impact. But if you, can, if you can really embed it into a process, it really is a process where there's a participatory respect yeah. Uh, throughout the process, but you've got to start at schematic, ideally, and certainly very early in design development when you're talking about buildings, um, and make everybody a partner in learning. Yeah. You know, it's not it, it's not just the, tell me what I have to do or what I should do, but actually make it participatory to the extent possible. Um, Jay has another question about transportation, um, and asking again, they want to know arguments, um, arguments for um, how to present a more convincing argument that might encourage the powers that be to embrace the notion of shared spaces and actually complete work that's been promised for years. Um, yeah, I mean, the uh, Patty Moore um, told me a great story when she was working, I think it was on the Phoenix mass transit, that they were trying to have a step free access. And mm -hmm. They were going to go in with, you know, people in wheelchairs will have an easier time. 
but they went in with businessmen with roller luggage will have an easier time and mothers with buggies will have an easier time and people in wheelchairs will have an easier time and have a more pleasant experience. So if you can be kind of inclusive in your arguments and look for use cases, it's a bit like I showed the, the garment that hardens on impact. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's great for frequent callers in care homes. It's also great for skateboarders and motorcycle careers. Uh, uh, I, you know, think about the curb cut. The curb cut was a, an accessibility early icon, but yeah. it's made scooters and fabulous strollers of all kinds feasible. Yeah. Um, Jay, we should talk about um, the work that we do with our transit system because we do it very extensively. And I think we have got an argument that has sold. So we should talk further. Lisa is back um, asking about issues of gender inclusivity. Have you been looking at that issue? You yeah. noted it earlier, but not specifically. So um, I didn't show, we've done a lot around inclusive public toilets and we have in the Helen Hamlin Center. Uh, her name is Joanne Bishard, Professor Joanne Bishard. And she, um, it's a shame in an hour, uh, you know, you can only show so much, but in the book, <laughs> a great case study of something she's done called the Great British Toilet Map. And she she's used open access data, local authorities to make it available to people who didn't know that they could go into a pub which is being paid by the local council to make their toilets accessible um, to anybody who needs it. So you can now go into a city, look at the app, and it will tell you exactly where there's a, an accessible toilet. But she's done a lot of work around gender. She's written a lot about it. Um, so her name is Joanne Bishard, um, and she's Professor of Accessibility uh, in the Helen Hamlin Centre. And she's very available to fund online. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of good articles. If you have any trouble finding it, let us know. We have them. Um, uh, if someone is asking about strategies you've developed to make primarily visual experiences accessible to people with vision limitations. Yeah, we've done work in that area. Again, I direct you to Julia Kassim, who, before she joined the Helen Hamlin Center, she was, she was doing a lot of work in Japan, which are quite leaders in this area. Um, we've tended, um, we haven't uh, in recent years done a huge amount in this area, although since my time as director we've worked, um, um, we've worked on a number of projects with London galleries around, around social inclusion and that's included uh, low vision. Um, but we've done a lot of low vision stuff around the home, um, but there's so much more to do. And, um, and, uh, um, and we're happy to follow up also on the low vision. Um, among the people in the world who are doing the most interesting work on um, information, visual information made available for people with vision limitations is Tactile in Paris, um, doing extraordinary work, yeah. hundreds of locations a year. Um, we also uh, did a study last year for our commission on uh, the Mass Commission for the Blind on the current state of affairs of inclusive design in the workplace. And that was an assessment of research across the world um, and sort of guidelines that exist anywhere in the world on that. So happy to share that also. Um, yeah. And, and, and Susan, just, just on that point, Susan might like to have a look at the work that we did um, with the Welcome, for, the Welcome Collection. Ah. We, we rewrote their yes. inclusive design guidelines, um, not just about low vision, but about accessibility generally, but also about neurodiversity. Um, and, and one of the other things that uh, just to pass along relative to tactile experience, we have also found that tactile experience is extraordinarily valuable, uh, well beyond people with vision limitations. And we found a spectrum of people with brain based conditions to really benefit enormously from that tactile information. Uh, it, it, it's stickier if you have that opportunity. And of course, all of us like to touch things. Uh, frightened for a bit last year, but back to wanting to touch things. <laughs> um, and we've got a couple more. Can you take a couple more minutes? Yeah, I've got it. All right. All right. Um, do you know about Universal Design for Learning, uh, Jeremy? That, is a, a, that has been led by an organization that is in the greater Boston area called CAST. 
Um, and they actually learned the term universal design from um, our originally named organization, Adaptive Environments. And they have really done brilliant work. It's a, it's a marvelous now international phenomenon. Um, are you familiar with it, Universal Design for Learning? Um, I've heard, because I, I, I have American relatives and um, um, I have a very, uh, one of my cousins, Jeannie Myerson in New York, uh, and she, um, she uh, has mentioned this to me, um, but I haven't looked into it in any detail. Okay. Um, but I, I, I you know, the principles of, of, of you know, the people-centric principles can be applied in all manner of things. Yes, in all manner of things. Um, so we can't give you, uh, we do, uh, we certainly are invested, Marion, in, uh, in issues of the integration of uh, uh, software solutions or digital solutions with environment. If there is anything else. Um, um, I know, I know um, Louise is asking about people ident identifying as transgendered. Yes. Um, no, we haven't, and that's probably an area we'll the, the Helen Hamlin community will get into. We have had fashion students do gender neutral clothing, which is not quite the same thing, but um, that's, that's where we've gone in that area. But in the UK, this is absolutely the subject. It's it's a very big subject here too. <laughs> Um, have you done any work looking at left-handedness or ambidextrousness um, in projects? Interesting question. I can't think of anything. Um, no, it's very interesting, Jeremy. One of the things that, that we've become very sensitive to, partly because we have many user experts who have the experience of a stroke, which mm -hmm. tends to have a hemispheric impact. So really thinking about solutions that work for this, you know, there's a 10 to 13% of the population, very big number. Yeah. I tell um, where you might look there, we have an ongoing project. I mentioned Gian Paolo Fazzari, you saw him inside the cardboard ambulance um, being beaten up by the paramedic um, in the nicest possible way. Um, uh, he's done, he's doing a big project with St. Mary's Hospital. We have an offshoot of the Helen Hamlin Center called the Helix Center that's a frontline innovation space in St. Mary's Hospital in Paddington. And Gian Paolo is doing work on stroke rehabilitation. Oh. And I'm sure um, one handedness would come into that. Terrific, that's a, a great lead. Thanks so much. Um, one of our board members, Meg Smith, um, who is a lighting researcher. Um, I've been quoting you saying, you now believe in the value of intelligent workspaces. Um, have you thought about the application of the IOT, the Internet of Things and Lighting to support diverse populations in shared spaces? Yes, so um, that is a really good, uh, that is a really good um, question and comment because the smart office has moved forward more in the last 10 months than it has in the last 10 years. And, um, but, and we now have the IoT, all devices being connected, inanimate objects being connected, and we can do predictive analytics about which bits of the building are going to fail, which lights are going to, you know, and so on and so forth. And, and we, you know, a light bulb is no longer a light bulb, it's a sensor, it's measuring what people are doing and how hot or cold or what the air quality is like. So we're going to have a much more sentient and intelligent workplace. Um, there is a big push now, especially since the pandemic. Um, to wake the real estate industry up. If we're going to talk about diversity in the workplace, um, then, um, then we've, uh, we've got to uh, create spaces that adapt to people's uh, different sensory needs and, and functional needs. Um, uh, I think we're getting more uh, diverse populations, but I always quote one of my favorite um, designers and, and thinkers in the office space is a woman called Kay Sargent at HOK Architects. And, um, and uh, she says, diversity is about counting people. Uh, inclusion is about making people count. And I love that quote because, <laughs> because you know, it's a really, you know, um, 
why have diversity if you're not going to include them? Um, and technical solutions have been very hard nosed. It's been about productivity and, you know, operational efficiency. And I think we've got to cross over and talk about a more human centric workplace. And I think now that offices are in a competition with the home and the cafe and the co working space, you know, and people are saying, well, I'm not going to go back to the office all the time. They're going to have to work a lot harder. So I'm hoping that we're going to have a more intelligible workplace. <laughs> Thank you, Jeremy. Meg's delighted. Um, uh, I, I, I do want to I do want to give you a chance to talk about the upcoming book with the University of Chicago Press. Um, but I also think there's an important question that, that I know you've been asked as often as I've been asked, and that is from Matthew McNeely, and it's how do you make sure that you make that you cater to everyone from the margins to the mainstream? And have you ever encountered needs for different folks that seem to be in conflict? Um, well, the way to cater for everyone from the margins to the mainstream is not do anything on the margins, you know, um, do it in the mainstream. Um, and I know that sounds simplistic, but that's where good design comes in. That's where, you know, good aesthetic design, good intelligible design, you know, a lot of a lot of problems got fixed with really, you know, very poorly designed aids and appliances that did the job but made people feel miserable. And uh, you know, certain mobility scooters fall into that category. But if you create something that's cool, that's in the mainstream, you know, I mean, for years we had uh, mobile phone manufacturers come to us, design us a phone for older people. When we spoke to older people, they don't want a phone for older people. They just want the ordinary phone to be better. And then came the Apple iPhone and hey presto. So that answers that question. Um, how we ever encountered needs of different folk that seem to be in conflict all the time. You know, uh, to the earlier question about community engagement, you talk to different communities um, and, um, and they want different things. And you've got to try and you know, you don't ignore the things that separate people, but you try and look for things that bring people together. And, and one of our one of our abiding kind of principles in the in the um, in the Helen Hamlin Center was was borrowed from the American community architecture movement around asset mapping. And we always used to say to our teams, you know, map the assets, you know, not the deficits, you know. Go to a housing estate. Tell us what we can use. You know mm -hmm. what could be good. Um, mm -hmm. Don't tell us what's broken and wrong. And you know, um, uh, um, or don't just tell us what what what's broken and wrong. Um, you know, and and I think if you find if you find if you look hard enough, you'll find something that unites people. Thank you. That was that was um, beautifully said. Um, Jeremy, tell us about the upcoming book, because as you probably know, and as you and I have talked, the future of work is on everyone's tongue um, and keeping people up at night. Um, so talk to us about what you're going to do next. And if people don't know, I'm actually going to post on our website um, some of your publications that have been freely available on Workspace, predating the, the extraordinary experience of our global pandemic. Yes. So your next adventure is with the Chicago of University, the University of Chicago Press. Tell us yes. about the future. So, so it's Reaction Books in the UK and the University of Chicago Press. It's called the working title. Um, it's written. It's in production. It's coming out early next year. Um, it's called Unworking: The Reinvention of the Modern Office. <laughs> so it's a hundred-year history from the early early nineteen twenties. So when Chicago and New York and Boston were in full swing um, to the early 2020s and what's happened to the office, what were the what are the basic ideas and it's dealing with issues, it's dealing with urbanism, um, you know, central business districts and what's happened to them and it's dealing with space, with with diversity, with hybridity, with demographics. Um, it's kind of an ambitious book that I've written with Philip Ross. Uh, with whom I set up the Work Tech uh, Academy, um, and uh, and um, so um, we've sub we've submitted all the manuscripts and the pictures, and we 
we uh, we hope for a, a publication next year. Maybe I'll come back and talk about it. Oh, we love it. Consider yourself invited. Um, uh, absolutely. And Philip. Uh, absolutely. Get Philip over as well. Yes. Um, yes. But uh, yeah, I mean, co-writing is always a challenge, but we have done a few books together. So we, we've developed a way of uh, collaboration. I just mentioned a couple of the big ideas on workspace, because I think they've proven to be extremely valuable to us over time to share with people um, different ways of thinking. I mean, I think the, uh, what was it? Concentrate, collaborate, and... Contemplate. Contemplate, yes, the three C's of the workplace. But yeah. that was, what year was that? That was about 2009. And it was, um, for those of you who've been to London and seen the Shard, the Shard used that research model uh, to let their floors. So they had, they had kind of show elements that, you know, they showed what a collaboration space could look like, what a, what a, what a focus, what a concentration space could look like. And, and, and uh, Jeremy, uh, let, me, let me share with you something that, that has been a, a fairly recent uh, report of what's happened in the American workspace uh, since COVID. In 1919, we had just over 11% of the workforce uh, had experiences of uh, depressive or anxiety disorders. And that has gone up to over 30%. So I think the, the, the new workplace um, needs to pay particular attention to notions of space for contemplation. Yeah. And probably to a sense of control, which yeah. is very much missing in the yeah. workplace. So, so the reason we, basically most offices had desks where you work individually and then glass box meeting rooms where you met. And then they had a little bit of breakout stuff which people didn't feel they had permission to go into. And they tended to put, they were, the breakout spaces were put in the noisiest areas. So you couldn't lie down and sleep, for example. And so we suggested in one project, you know, day beds, um, lots of foliage and green so you couldn't be spied on by your boss, a dead zone so nobody could get a mobile phone. I mean, it's all pretty obvious stuff, but, but um, we're very interested in the ability, you know, because we were looking at older workers to restore during the day. And of course, these are ideas that people are now coming back to. And one of the one of the things that strikes me about the new hybrid world of work, and we talk about it in the new book, um, is that actually for people with different needs, a more hybrid working model enables them to have a career. If you've got hospital appointments, if you're caring for an older relative, you know, if you've got medical needs that require you to have an on day and an off day, or, or a quiet day, you know, um, uh, to restore, you know, hybrid working is fantastic for a more diverse workforce. Um, and, you know, what was terrible was the presenteeism. And if you didn't come into the office, you weren't on the radar for promotion or training, you know, and you were seen as a bit of a wimp, you know, well, how does that help people? And I think people have, have managed things in the pandemic, you know, childcare and, 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 and deliveries and getting your dry cleaning done and <laughs> having a bit more control rather than surrendering to the corporate machine, you know, you know. Flexibility. Yeah. Uh, we, we've all built a very big appetite for flexibility. We have a question that all of us want you to make sure that we've got right. And you had quoted K Sargent at HOK relative to diversity and inclusion. Would you restate that? Um, she said, diversity is about counting people. Inclusion is about making people count. <laughs> now, whether she borrowed it from somebody else, but she said it very recently at a work tech conference. I'm going to contact her. And, uh, contact her. And uh, we're all going to be anxious to quote her. So tell her to get it nailed for us to share. And if yeah. it belongs to somebody else, that's fine. Her name, her name is Kay Sargent, and it's uh, S-A-R-G-E-N-T. And she is the doyen of neurodiversity in the workplace. But she's also the workplace director of one of the world's largest architectural practice. So she kind of, you know, she walks the talk, really. We, we've, we've had the great opportunity and privilege to learn a lot about um, workplace design from 
um, people with neurodiversity from our own staff and from uh, interns uh, who've taught us a great deal about what's effective and nothing more effective than flexibility of where you work and how you work. Um, so I, I, um, I've just noticed Niall Tarrell is, is, uh, is uh, uh, what am I going to do next? Niall, it's great to, great to see your name. Um, a, a great helper uh, in the early days of the Helen Hamlin Center. Uh, worked with our researchers around issues of disability and uh, access. And Niall, is the, Niall it was the trigger for asking what are you doing next and getting a chance for you to talk about the new book. Ah, brilliant. <laughs> what are you doing next? Um, well, Jeremy, may there be many what are you doing next um, because it is always so satisfying and such fun. So we well, are... What are doing next is because um, it's evening in London, I'm going to pour myself a beer. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we hope when the world um, returns to a state that um, allows a bit of travel, perhaps we can entice you back to town. Uh, I would love to come and see you in Boston. And it was always a pleasure in the past. Um, maybe I'll, I'll come and see you again when we can, when they let us out. Um, yep. <laughs> uh, uh, in the Brexit prison we find ourselves in. Um, <laughs> let's, not, let's not go there. Um, <laughs> It's a great pleasure to speak to everybody and I hope I haven't detained everybody uh, too long. Happy with the opportunity. So we are in your debt. We, well, I'm sure most of us wish we could have a beer with you now. <laughs> we'll have a virtual one. We'll have a virtual one. We will certainly toast you. Um, thank you, my friend. Um, this has been a wonderful experience and uh, we will be sharing this with everyone. Um, we will edit the captions. We do, we do live captioning of these um, global webcasts, and then we clean them up and we post them on our YouTube channel. So we will certainly be sharing that um, as soon as we can. Jeremy, my friend, thank you so much. It's a pleasure. Nice to see everybody.